I'm Stumpy Nubs, this is Mustache Mike, and welcome to another episode of Behind the Sawdust. This week, we help Chris Schwartz hit bottom, make a big WIA announcement, the stash gets lonely. We compare compound miter saws, complain about the Oscars, show off some great projects, make a 10 second table saw sled, and give away a $200 tool. But first, the woodworking news. Chris Schwartz says that steam bending is almost too easy. So if you've been afraid to try it, listen up. In his popular woodworking blog, Chris tells all you need to know about his setup. He says just about any box will work because this is one of those cases when you actually want to make something with a few gaps or leaks in it. Otherwise, you won't be building a steam box, you uh, might be building a bomb. To make the steam, you can use a tea kettle or a hot plate. But of course, something like the Erlex steam generator is safer because it shuts off automatically if the water runs out. Now, that's how he gets steamed, but that's only half the story. His blog goes on to talk about building forms for bending and a whole lot more. You'll find a link below in the shop notes. Speaking of Chris Schwartz, he says sometimes you have to kiss the devil on the tongue. Obviously, we've dated some of the same people. Chris bared his soul in a recent blog at Lost Art Press. He tells the story of his first job in journalism and the nightmare of mistakes that he made that probably should have got his butt canned many times over. He tried to work through it, but things just kept getting worse until he hit absolute bottom over what he calls one wretched weekend. It was painful, and to this day he won't even go into detail with anyone but close friends. But it led to a new beginning, and he's applied the lesson to woodworking. Sometimes a project just isn't turning out. You can try to rethink it, you can walk away and take a break, but sometimes you just have to bottom out, admit failure and begin again. I've done this many times with my homemade tool designs. I've spent weeks on a concept only to throw the whole mess at the wall and start over. Sometimes more than once. It can be frustrating, it can be expensive, you may even have to keep a drywall around retainer, but inevitably it leads to better things. So who says hitting rock bottom is always a bad thing? You can never have too many clamps. Or can you? It seems like the powerful clamp lobby may have misled us. Woodworking pro Bob Rozelski once drank the Kool-Aid, but when he began looking at the inventories of period workshops, he changed his tune. Clamps made from wood or iron were used back as far as the 1600s, likely even earlier. But you don't see huge racks full of clamps in the illustrations of the day. Why? because their style of woodworking didn't require as many. Well-cut dovetails or mortise and tenon joints that were wedged or draw board don't really require glue for strength. No glue meant no clamps. And even when they did add glue, the joint itself was tight enough that the clamps weren't really needed. Bob's lesson, there's no doubt that clamps are handy tools. But don't sell your joinery short. It may not be required that you clamp at all. Hand tool expert and period furniture maker Adam Cherubini prefers to draw a historic piece rather than photographing it. The problem is he's not skilled in the sketching arts. So why not photograph? Is it because modern cameras wouldn't look right with his old timey clothing? No, he says that sketching forces you to understand the way a piece of furniture was made. A camera only captures a quick overview, but when you are drawing it part by part, you tend to spend time on the details. You imagine the tenons hidden on the inside, why a part is shaped the way it is, or why a particular form adds both strength and beauty. It forces you to increase your knowledge of furniture construction. You can't see every detail from the outside, so you have to rely upon that knowledge to fill in the blanks. Painters used to dissect cadavers to understand muscle structure so they could properly reproduce the form. In the same way, a period furniture maker has to understand both the inside and the outside. He's written an article explaining this concept far better than I am, so I'll link to it in the show notes. Jim Heavey of Wood Magazine has been traveling the woodworking show circuit for 15 years now, and he says he's seen a lot of changes. In a recent interview with 360 Woodworking, he talks about the good and the bad days of the iconic franchise. 15 years traveling with the show is a long time. I mean, that has got to get tedious. I know he tries to change his classes up a little bit, but 
I mean, it's going to be the same booths, the same vendors, same cities, a lot of the same people all the time. And I know they've had some problems on the circuit in the past. Yeah, in fact, you discussed that here in the article, how many different owners the shows have went through and the times when vendors were unhappy. And if the vendors are unhappy, that's going to float over into unhappy participants. And it really affects the overall uh, effect of the show. You know, frankly, if you look at it, I think one time it uh, was looking like the whole thing could collapse. Yeah, and I think that a lot of that had to do with the fact that they had gotten away from teaching. They were spending so much time just trying to sell tools, and everybody wants to go woodworking tool shopping, but when you're paying for admission, you want something more than that you can take away, not just a big sales pitch. Yeah, and uh, the new owner, that's what he's going to focus on. Uh, more classes, better speakers. Uh, in fact, he says there's going to be so much teaching going on that even if you went every day from open to close for the whole weekend, it'd be hard to take it all in. But really, if you think about it, that's what people really want. They want to take something home they can use from these shows. Yeah, I really like the whole interview that he did. It was very candid, and it's nice to see the woodworking shows are back on track. The woodworking shows will be in Atlanta from March 6th through 8th. There are 63 classes on the three-day schedule, and all are included for the price of admission, except those taught by Mark Adams and one by Bradley McAllister. Tickets are $10 online and $12 at the door. Of course, the woodworking shows aren't the only woodworking shows out there. Popular Woodworking has leaked some of the details for the granddaddy of them all, Woodworking in America 2015. It'll be held September the 25th through the 27th in Kansas City, Missouri. It will be three days of tools and techniques featuring the biggest names in the craft. Classes will be taught by an array of woodworking legends, including none other than Roy Underhill, David Marks, Tom Fidgen, and our very own Stumpy Nubs. Yes, you heard that right. Stumpy is on the same playbill as Roy Underhill, which means that the Midwest isn't the only thing that's frozen over lately. I will also be attending, and we'll have our own booth on the floor as well. So we look forward to meeting many of you this fall. More details will be released in the coming months, but I can say this, Stumpy's classes will be well worth the price of admission. Chuck Bender is a power tool guy, like Norm Abram, Tim Taylor, and that guy who juggles chainsaws in the subway. But even he admits you should have some basic hand tool skills. There are some tasks that are simply best done by hand. His early shop teacher encouraged him to learn hand tool techniques through a useful exercise making a sanding block with a diamond shaped inlay. The project helps build planing and chiseling skills, it can be finished in an afternoon and just takes a few tools, and it will produce a sander that you'll use for many years to come. He's written an extensive article that not only shows how to make the sanding block, but teaches you the hand tool lessons that go along with it. You have to be a subscriber to access the article, but it may be a great opportunity to learn the type of hand tool skills that power tool woodworkers will find most useful. Are you lonely in your workshop? Most hobbyists work alone, but some professionals have shared shops at different points in their careers. Paul Sellers is one such woodworker, and he recently wrote about the pros and the cons of sharing a workspace. It's an interesting topic, so it's the subject of this edition of Point and counterpoint. I like to work alone. I can do my own thing without worrying if other people are bothered by my singing. I like to share my workspace. Time goes by quicker if you have somebody to talk about last night's reality show. While I agree that it's sometimes nice to chat while you work, I think it can hurt your productivity. Nobody works as quickly when they're talking to someone as they do when they're concentrating on the project. When we were kids, we weren't allowed to talk all summer long. And if that policy was good enough for the gravel pits, it's good enough for my workshop. Hey, working in the gravel pit, you and your brother when you were kids made you a lot tougher, and it served you real well when you had to fight that little neighborhood girl. Besides, woodworking isn't just about productivity. It's also about enjoying yourself. If it was just about getting things done, I'd be paid by the project rather than by the hour. A little neighbor girl. She was 6'4 and 280 in the fourth grade, and she whooped my butt. And he may be paid by the hour, but I get paid by the project, and I have to pay him from what I get paid. So efficiency is very important. Besides, a quiet, distraction-free shop is a safer shop. Oh, wait a minute. Remind me again. Wasn't Stumpy alone in the shop that time he stuck the chisel through his hand? Professionals can woodwork and chew bubblegum at the same time. 
I've never had an accident and I've spent half a day distracted by my awesome mustache alone. Burt Reynolds here may like to share his workspace, but that often means sharing your tools too. Even when you have signs all over the shop that say, don't touch or I'll sand your face off. Well, what about exchanging your ideas? Having another person in the shop is a great way to solve problems. Who do you think we have around this shop? You just admitted that you like to milk your time for extra money. Chip never likes to do anything but sweep. And last good idea Randy had was wearing his underwear on the inside of his pants. We're not dealing with a bunch of experts around here. My point is working alone is just plain boring. Working with someone you like is fun. You know, someday I hope to experience that in our shop. You don't have fun around here? Yesterday you glued the dog to the cat. If you'd like to weigh in on this issue, please do so in the comments below. Gunzhou 2015 is being held today in China. It's billed as a Chinese version of Germany's Furniture Supply Show, which I believe is a German version of France's Chair and Ottoman Fair, which is a French version of London's International Expo for makers of those little furniture sliders that go under your chair's feet. This is expected to be a large turnout show in China, but attendees will probably be hungry for more show a couple of hours later. In a story that doesn't include an embarrassing bad joke, Woodworkers Journal has some new talent. The bi-monthly magazine has hired two new writers to fill their pages. Larry Okrand, formerly the editor-in-chief of Handy Magazine, and Kimberly McNeilan, who is a young woodworker who will bring a fresh perspective to the journal. They will be creating a project-related article each month that can be built in a small workshop further reaching out to what has long been the main subscriber base of Woodworkers Journal. Have you ever heard of Nathaniel Gould? Me neither. But he was once considered among the best 18th century New England cabinet makers. Up until now, little was known about him or his work. A single piece at the Metropolitan Museum of Art bore his name, but it was a simple Google search that revealed a lost collection of woodworking history. An antique dealer, who thought he had a piece of furniture that looked like the Metz Gould piece, hired an investigator, who found a set of ledgers hidden in the archives of the Massachusetts Historical Society. You see, Gould died around the end of the Revolutionary War, and his ledgers had been sitting in the Society's vaults since they were donated all the way back in 1834. Inside is the most complete set of records of any 18th century cabinet maker known to exist. He recorded what he built, who he sold his furniture to, and other information that has led to identifying over 50 beautiful pieces of his furniture in various collections. Not only has the reputation of a master woodworker been restored, but the ledgers also give an amazing glimpse into the workings of a colonial American workshop. Chris Marshall of Woodworkers Journal is testing 10-inch sliding compound miter saws. These popular shop machines come with a wide range of prices and features. And this test covered seven of the most common models from Bosch, Craftsman, DeWalt, Cobalt, Makita, Rigid, and Ryobi. The surprise standout was the $399 Rigid MS-255SR, which he said was a pleasure to use. It was well designed, came with a high quality Freud blade, and was second only to the DeWalt DW717 in Dust Collection, which was the saw he rated second best because of its $50 higher price tag and fewer bells and whistles. The Royobi and the Cobalt saws fared the worst. But, to be fair, they were priced at only $200, not in the same class as the other saws in the test. You can find a complete review of all seven saws in the April issue of Woodworker's Journal. Festool has got into the oscillating multi-tool game. Since the original patents for these handy little suckers expired a few years ago, it seems like everybody has been making them. You can buy a cheap one for as little as 15 bucks. But in keeping with their high dollar top quality model, Festool's OS 400 starts at $425. Why so much? Well, that's like asking why is the sky blue? Obviously, it's because it's unlike any other sky in the market. Likewise, Festool claims to have revolutionized the oscillating multi-tool by adding to the power, reducing the vibration, and creating several clever accessories, including a plunging base, a adjustable fence, and a depth stop. These add-ons will run you another $165, but Festool fans are already lining up to buy them. Did you watch the Oscars last weekend? Me neither. But Stumpy, of course, has something to say about them. Well, another day, another award show. I can't believe how often these celebrities get together to pat themselves on the back. It's embarrassing, really. 
They work for a few months every few years and spend the rest of their time standing on red carpets and posting selfies of themselves on the internet. Well, I say nuts to that. I think it's high time we start rewarding the right people for the right things. Tell me, who's more worthy of an award? Some dude who wears a bunch of makeup and gets paid to say what other people write for him? Or us woodworkers? Shouldn't we have a sidewalk with stars on it that honor people like Goddard and Townsend? Why don't we have Duncan Fife's handprints in cement? So what if Liam Neeson is good at pretending to be an action hero? Sam Maloof changed the way we sit. What kind of world do we live in when more people know those idiots who made a movie about a hot tub time machine than could pick Frank Klaus out of a police lineup after an all-night bender? The public went nuts when somebody snapped a photo of Taylor Swift on the beach, but nobody wants to see my pictures of Charles Neal in his bikini. And tell me, what have those Duck Dynasty guys got that Peter Follensby hasn't? People love to see celebrity wardrobe malfunctions, but when I flash a nipple, it hardly ever makes the news. The world isn't fair, folks, and it's time we do something about it. So today, I ask you to join me in a pledge, never to watch the Oscars again until society gives woodworkers the honor they deserve by carving Roy Underhill's face into Mount Rushmore. Or at least put his hat on Jefferson. I'm willing to compromise. And that's all I have to say about that. This week, we have some great projects to show off. First up is Chris and his stunning fretwork Ferris wheel. It took 41 hours to make the 1,700 cuts. Iceman Hank decided to take a stab at making his own hand plane. He used a kit from Veritas for the hardware and a piece of Australian Gigi for the body. Bruce from Boise, Idaho built this cement mixer from walnut and maple. He says he thinks that the barrel should be larger, but his grandson doesn't seem to mind. Unknown Woodturner rebuilt a 1934 Ford Woody wagon for his boss. It took him five years and it was his first attempt at such a project. And finally, we have a pen press from MF Woodshop. He built it using plans from Laney Shaughnessy and it appears that it's a great money saver for people who want to get into pen turning. If you have a project that you think might inspire others, send some photos in the description to support at stumpynubs.com. This week's tip is a simple solution for a tricky problem. Sometimes you have to make a cut on an asymmetrical workpiece that can't be run against the fence. A sled is usually your best option, if you have one handy. But if you have a piece of T-Track and a couple of clamps, you can make a sled in seconds. The T-Track fits inside the miter slots on most table saws, keeping the workpiece parallel to the blade through the cut, no matter it, what its shape is. And when you're finished, it doesn't take much storage space either. For more woodworking tips, visit StumpyNubs.com and look for the tab that says Shop Tips. Few things can irritate me as much as a hinge that's mounted crooked. It can completely throw a door out of alignment and it always looks terrible. The problem is, if you don't get your pilot holes drilled in exactly the right place, the tapered screw heads can cause the hinge to shift. Thankfully, there's a tool for that, these self-centering bits from Rockler. Now, Mustache Mike has been using them for a while now, and he's ready to judge them based on his scientifically proven mustache meter system that looks at quality, performance, and overall value. So let's get started with quality. How well are they made? Well, you'd think it'd be pretty hard to mess something that's all steel up, but I have had problems with self-centering bits before. Either the Allen screw strips out, it doesn't hold well, the housing gets jammed and you can't plunge down. So as we did the test on this, I was really looking for those particular things to see how they were uh, going to work out. Actually, um, it's completely uh, heavier than any of my other self-centering bits. It's clearly made from good materials. I uh, love the way the Allen screw really fits nicely inside so the bits aren't going to slip. And that means you don't have to torque down so hard on it. And that's usually what messes them up anyways, is just, you know, twisting on that Allen screw. Uh, I don't have any reason to give it any less than five mustaches for quality. Real well built. All right. Well, what about performance? Do they do what they're supposed to do? Well, you know, the way these things are made is the outer housing is tapered to a point, so it automatically centers when you put it into a hole in a hinge or whatever you're mounting. So you can just go from one mounting hole uh, to another, um, whatever you're working on. I had no problems with jamming on anything that we tried it on. 
And again, uh, the big reason, I think, is because of these large uh, holes on the side, the wood chips, um, come right out. The quick release end is really going to work well whether you got it on a power drill or any of the various drivers that you might have in your tools. Again, it did everything that it was supposed to do, so uh, five mustaches in that. All right. And finally, overall value. Was it worth the price? Well, we've already established, of course, it's well made. And this also comes with a nice carrying case, which uh, is great. Uh, this set I got on sale was $20. The regular price is usually $30. You know, it seemed a little bit high, but, you know, not so much when you think of the quality. One thing that I did think was uh, a little odd was there's no Allen wrench that comes with it in the set to change the bits. I would have liked to have seen that, yeah. so I'm going to take one mustache off for that. Four. There you have it, folks. The Rockler self-centering drill bit set gets an average of four and a half out of five on the mustache o meter, making it a solid purchase. As you know, we've been giving away a lot of tools lately, and this week will be no exception. Max Blanton, you are the proud winner of a brand new WorkSharp 3000 tool sharpening system. Congratulations, Max. This was so much fun, I think we'll do it again in our next episode, which will be two weeks from today. So, if you want one of these great sharpening systems, which retail for 200 bucks, here's how to enter. There are three ways to enter. You can do one of them, or you can do all three to dramatically increase your odds of winning. First one, visit StumpyNubs.com and sign up for our newsletter. If you're already signed up, you're already entered. Second option, follow us on Twitter and tweet out, at StumpyNubs is giving away a... Hashtag WorkSharp3000. You have to follow us and tweet it out. Or the third option, like our Stumpy Nubs Workshop Facebook page and post on your Facebook page, the Stumpy Nubs Workshop is giving away a WorkSharp3000. Now you're going to want to be sure that the Stumpy Nubs Workshop part is tagged so that we'll see it. So you may have to begin by typing at Stumpy Nubs until the Stumpy Nubs Workshop tag pops up for you and then you can select it. If you use Facebook, you know what I mean. Remember, you post that on your Facebook page, not ours. And you also have to like our Facebook page. Every week, we'll randomly pick a name from each of those three different types of entries. Throw those final three into a hat and pick a single winner. So, if you want to keep it simple, you can just sign up for the newsletter. But, if you want to triple your chances, you can do all three. Well, that about wraps things up for this episode of Behind the Sawdust. We're not going to be having an episode next week because I'm going to have to spend some extra time on my upcoming book. But we will have a video online and a new project plan, a homemade shop vac cyclone. Behind the Sawdust, we'll be back the following Saturday with all the woodworking news, tips and tools, and infotainment you can handle. Please consider visiting StumpyNubs.com and checking out the amazing homemade woodworking tool plans we have there and the Stumpy swag. It's how we support the show and we appreciate every one of you more than you could possibly know. In fact, you should sit back and have yourself a cold one, because you've earned it, my friend.